Uh, so, uh, our, we're going to start with uh, Leah Krubitzer, who is co-organizer uh, for uh, the talks this week. And uh, Leah has been coming to BCBT for several years now. She was uh, originally a speaker that I invited the first time we thought we would do Evo Devo as the theme. And I didn't know her, but I had uh, come across her work on the development of cortex in different species, and I thought that this was really critical to what we're trying to do, which is to understand how to synthesize these kinds of complex systems for robots. And that theme has then recurred in the last couple of years when uh, Leia has been a co-organizer. And uh, you know, as an organizer of these things, uh, you invite all your friends first, and then you invite your friends' friends, and then uh, it's great to have one of your friends become a co-organizer because you know, she has a, another huge circle of contacts that uh, we couldn't reach. And uh, so there's to thank really for many of the great speakers that we'll have this week. So uh, Leia's love of science is uh, only matched by her love of Barcelona. Uh, and I think that's the other reason she keeps coming back here. So uh, it's great to have you here, Leia, and we're looking forward to the talk. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Good? Okay, good. Okay, so if we ever do this again, I get to te I get, I'm going to speak first because every time Tony said Leah's going to talk about that, I'm thinking, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> so I want to do that like Tony's going to talk about this. Um, so, what, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a brief introduction, and what I like to do is give an introduction to our speakers, um, of all of our speakers with their, with their uh, pictures, so that uh, part of this whole thing is for you guys, the students, postdocs, um, to interact with the speakers. And it's been really great because a number of the speakers who are even going to speak later in the week are already here. So there's lots of opportunity at lunch, at coffee breaks, when you first get in in the morning um, to interact with the speakers. OK, so um, some of what I'm going to say is a little bit redundant. Um, but Tony brought up a, a lot of really good points. Um, to understand the evolution and development uh, and the behaviors that emerge both within a lifetime and across generations, we can't study the brain in isolation. And he brought up this idea of this multi-level approach. And it's not just a multi-level approach, it's a multidisciplinary approach to study multiple levels of organization from genes to brains to individuals to societies. And it's really important to remember because I think we've gotten very, very gene-centric in the past decade where we think there's a gene for really complex behavior. We make this um, the gene for language, the gene for autism, the gene for schizophrenia, and so on. And it, it's not that simple. Um, the, the genes uh, co-vary. Um, with the targets of selection, but it's always important to remember that genes aren't selected for. Behavior in the phenotype is the target of selection. So it's not this very low level of molecules, but it's the individual, the behavior, and sometimes the extended phenotype. Um, so to, to sort of make this more clear, we're sort of, this meeting is, a, is sort of uh, centered around the brain. Um, I study the neocortex in particular, but uh, we can't study the brain in isolation, and a lot of us tend to do that. We look at one little level, um, one aspect uh, at one point in time in, in the life of, of our animal model. But the brain um, is embedded in a body, and the body has specialized effectors. In humans, we have the eyes and the hands. Um, brains develop and evolve with, other gr with groups of brains or societies, which impacts um, how the brain develops and evolves. Um, with uh, conspecifics, um, other animals on this planet, and it's becoming very important, uh, which is a very important part of how brains develop and evolve, um, and, and in some sort of physical environment. So um, all brains, well, at least mammalian brains and human brains, have early experience with language, culture, and social interactions. And larger, larger societies or groups of brains, which are us, we determine what experiences young brains should be exposed to, and we decide how brains should be shaped. And uh, the, also when I talk about my research, I'm not going to give a really long talk. Um, this is really important, not in just this sort of psychological sense that how I was raised determines my subsequent behavior, but how you are raised determines how your brain actually forms connections um, and how it's functionally organized and ultimately how you behave later. Um, and we can deconstruct the brain. So the brain is composed of networks, large networks, and microcircuits within smaller chunks of, of the brain. And these are composed of individual neurons, which a lot of times we try to understand how the brain works by sticking an electrode in a neuron and, and relating it to some aspect of behavior. Um, neurons talk to each other via synapses. Synapses, are, synapses have receptors or molecules often embedded in their membranes. 
And of course, we can look at an explanation at the level of the gene. And so what we try to do with our speakers um, is to have them discuss all levels of organization. And, and um, some of the questions that we're going to talk about this week are um, what factors contribute to brain organization, connectivity, and function during development um, and in species over time. Um, I don't know why those numbers have come up. Um, how do, <laughs> I didn't put them there. I'm not a very good PowerPoint person, though I was working on this late last night and early this morning. Late last night with a couple glasses of wine with Tony. <laughs> how do complex um, behaviors develop within an individual? Um, how do neurons code information necessary for spatial navigation? How plastic is the developing brain and subsequent behavior? What features of brain development and or organization are conserved and are there functional roles for brain enlargement? Um, what is the role of sensory motor development? Um, how do we mind travel? Oh, God. So oh, let me see this. Sorry about this, guys. How do we mind travel? This kind of got really screwed up here. Um, what is the role of sleep in sensory motor development? How do we mind travel? Um, how, do, how do variant body plans impact brain organization and function? Um, embodied brain organization and embodied intelligence. And to what extent and how rapidly can brain circuits be altered by, by experience in the adults? OK, now I can go back to the movie. So what I want to do is just introduce our speakers. And if, there, if, there's a real, if, this, if these are crappy pictures, you, then you guys need to put better things on the internet. Um, um, our first speaker tomorrow is going to be Edward, Edward Moser at the Cavalli Institute for Systems Neuroscience, Center for Neural Computation. And he's going to talk about grid cells and cortical maps for space. And of course, I have to say, it's pretty exciting to have all of our speakers, but it's really exciting because um, Dr. Mozar won, won the Nobel Prize. Um, and it's going to be a real opportunity for all of us to interact with him, and maybe a once in a lifetime opportunity to interact with the Nobel Prize winner. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty excited. And I might even be obsequious. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was when I invited him. OK. <laughs> Brian Kolb, also a wonderful speaker. I've heard him talk uh, several times. He's um, Department of Neuroscience, University of Lethbridge. Um, plasticity in the developing brain. He's not here, but he will probably arrive tonight. Uh, Barbara Finlay, Department of Psychology, Cornell University. Um, she's one of the few, it's, it's one of the few women who actually have uh, been involved in this studying evolution, uh, mammalian evolution, um, for, a no for a number of years. She's going to talk about robust, plastic, and scalable developmental organizing principles of the vertebrate brain. Mark Blumberg, Mark is here. Mark, can you raise your hand? There he is. Um, Department of Psychology, University of Iowa. Um, he's going to talk about develop, developing the sensory motor system in our sleep. Mark gave a talk at uh, uh, University of California, Davis, about two years ago, and it was absolutely fantastic. So some of these speakers I've heard give talks before, and some of them I haven't. I think you're going to be pretty excited. Um, John Lisman, he's uh, from the Vol uh, Volan Center for Complex Systems at Brandeis University. His talk is entitled, The Neural Systems for Spatial Location and Exploration, um, The Role of 10 Identified Cell Types. Steve Notter, Steve's here. Can you raise your hand, Steve? Um, he's at the Mind Institute, University of California, Davis. Um, Steve, I just heard him give a talk in Toledo. Really terrific. I think you're going to love it. Evol evolution and Regulation of Neural precursor, ce precursor Cells in the Developing Brain. Benny Hotchner. Benny, can you raise your hand? Benny's here, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's going to talk about embodied organization of the unique motor control of the octopus, flexible, and strange body. So I've never heard Dr. Hotchner speak, but I told him that um, recently I had a class on development and evolution of the, of the brain, and we read a number of his papers, and the students loved him. So I'm really looking forward to that. We have Greg Rickenzone. Um, he's also from the Center for Neuroscience, University of California, Davis. Um, he's going to talk about cortical plasticity throughout adulthood, implications for the evolution of the nervous sy system at the nanosecond scale. Greg's coming in tonight, so he's going to be here all week. So this is um, really fortunate that our speakers, most of our speakers are going to be here for a number of days, and some of them all week. So again, I want to encourage you at lunch not to just sit by somebody you know, but to actually sit next to the speakers and, and, and talk to them while they're chewing with their mouths full. <laughs> and you'll see they're just like us. OK. <laughs> so now I'll talk a little bit about my work. Um, and hopefully bring together this idea of evolution and development. And the title of my talk is Cortical Plasticity Within and Across Lifetimes, Contributions to the Cortical Phenotype. My earlier talks used to be, how does evolution build a complex brain? But if you just talk about evolution, you, you're going to lose a lot of stuff. Because um, it's not just genes that are evolving um, and, and being moved, uh, uh, propagated from one generation to the next. 
but it's a cortical phenotype, and the cortical phenotype is due to genes, but a lot of the cortical phenotype is also due to things that are non-genetic, so the environment or context. And I think a really, really good example of this is uh, modern Homo sapien. So anatomically, modern Homo sapiens have been around for 200,000 years ago, but if you looked at human society 200,000 years ago, it's not the same as human society now. Their brains were different, their connections were different, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that might happen during the course of development. Okay, so I focus my uh, research on the neocortex, and why do I study the neocortex? The neocortex is the portion of the brain that's involved in complex behaviors, inc including perception, cognition, language, reading. It's the part of the brain that, Tony, you haven't modeled yet, right? You've got a man right on that, though, right? <laughs> but it's amazing. You can do a lot without a cortex. Um, it's also the portion of the brain in mammals that is, that have ch that's changed most dramatically compared to other brain structures, like the spinal cord, the brain stem, um, the colliculus. So, so the neocortex is not just one big huge hunk of tissue. Some of you may or may not know this, but it's composed of multiple parts. And we've known this for a really long time. This is the work of an investigator called Corbinian Brodmann from 1909. And he cut human brain tissue. This is always amazing to me. So this is back in 1909. Not only human brain tissue, but a, a variety of different mammals stained it with missile substance, and he looked at the cortex, and he said it does not look homogeneous. It's composed of areas that look different. Now, we do this in our laboratory, and I've cut big brains and I've cut small brains, and it takes a lot of time with modern technology. Back in 1909, I don't know if he was doing this in his basement, what he was mounting the tissue on, if he and his wife ever spoke to each other, but it's really a, a heroic effort, and if you ever get a chance, his book has been interpreted in English, it's in German, you should read it, because it, it's part of the foundation of modern neuroscience. Okay, so my question, so I, 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 sh I didn't even explain this, sorry about that. So we, even back in 1909, we, here's a human brain, and all this different stipple is meant to indicate different parts of the brain. This is a common marmoset, the same thing, and this is a little hedgehog, this is a little tiny neocortex, and what you notice, and he noticed this, is that the human brain has lots of parts, and the hedgehog brain has tiny parts. So we know from the fossil record that um, Early mammals were very small, they were about this big, um, and they had little tiny brains that were smooth. And we know from comparative analysis that they probably only had a few cortical fields. Later in the century, mid, uh, in the 1950s and 40s, people stuck electrodes in different cortical fields, and they found that the neurons in those cortical fields responded to different types of stimulation. So these cortical fields don't only look different, they are functionally distinct. And if you record from them with um, an electrode, the neurons are interested in different things. So the question is, how do you go from a mammal or a brain that was something like this in the first mammal, this probably looks a lot like the first mammal brain, with a, a few cortical fields to a brain like this with hundreds of cortical fields? This is correlated with complex behavior. Um, and generally, on a good day, for example, I can do more than a mouse. Right now, <laughs> after last night, I can kind of do a little bit more than a mouse. Um, so, so it's not just how do you get a big brain with many parts, but then how does that generate really complex behavior? So that's the question of our laboratory. Um, going from 200, about 200 million year, years ago, a brain that looked like this with a few parts to a brain with many, many parts. And I have gray in here, but really this is filled with different cortical fields. And that's just a schematic. Okay, here's the problem. So this is, I'm going to tell you why we study, how, how we can answer this question um, about evolution with a developmental approach. The problem is that um, the evolution of the mammalian neocortex can't be studied directly. This is a process that takes generations, tens of thousands to millions of years. So how do I study this process? Well, I can, I can do a comparative analysis. So, for example, if I knew nothing about motors, I came down to the planet Earth, I knew nothing about motors, and I said, okay, I want to know what is motor like. And I studied a motorcycle, a truck, a lawnmower, um, a chainsaw, an automobile, and so on, there are going to be common features that all motors have. And I can say, okay, these features must be these, these, these are the necessary features of a motor. We could do the same thing with the soft, soft tissue of the neocortex. I can't know, um, I can't study the process directly, but I could say, okay, what has evolution produced? And what has evolution produced? It's produced extant animals. And so I could study extant animal brains, and I can do a comparative analysis. So I can say, okay, what's the same in all these brains, inherited from a common ancestor called homology, and what's different? The problem when we, we do this sort of comparative analysis is that evolution is a moving picture of life, and you are a moving picture of life from the day you're born to the day you're dead, and any time I look at a brain, I take a snapshot of that moving picture of life, and that's all I see. And I have all these snapshots, and I, I'm trying to build this big puzzle and see the big picture, and it's really difficult. 
So in order to get around this, I'm studying a snapshot or a frozen moment in time, I could study development because the evolution of the neocortex or how the cortex changes is really the evolution of developmental mechanisms that give rise to some aspect of brain organization like connections, neural response properties, and ultimately behavior, which is the target of selection. So I could study developmental mechanisms that give rise, rise to aspects of neocortical organization to know how phenotypic transformations may have arisen. So for example, Steve is going to talk about um, uh, precursor cells in the neocortex. So I know that some animals have a teeny neocortex and some animals have a large neocortex. If you do a comparative analysis of developmental mechanisms that are involved in generating the size of the cortical sheet, you can understand how that phenotypic transformation has arisen in the course of evolution. So that's why we mix you know, uh, studies of evolution with studies of development. So I'm going to focus today, my talk is going to be on this. All right, and so not just, just not just my talk, but you're going to hear a lot of different methods and levels of investigation that are associated with general questions or, or the hierarchy of life. Um, molecular and genetic, electrophysiological, um, studying neural response properties, neuroanatomy, looking at connections of different brain areas, and in, in my case, cortical areas, uh, behavior, so sensory mediated behaviors. Um, this can also include social behaviors. Okay, so comparative studies. So this is a cladogram that I made a number of years ago, and I've modified it over time, um, where we're looking at the different brains of different mammals, and the different colors are meant to in indicate different cortical fields. The same color indicates that that field is homologous. Every species that's ever been studied has that particular cortical field. In this case, it's V1 or it's blue. Um, this allows us to infer um, the common ancestor. So I can't study the common ancestor directly, but my interpretation of studying uh, an echidna, flying fox, cats, galagos, macaques, chimpanzees, mice, is that all of these animals have a blue area or a primary visual cortex. Um, there are a couple of scenarios in which that could have occurred. The common ancestor didn't have a primary visual cortex, and visual cortex evolved independently in thousands of species. That's very unlikely. Or common ancestor did have a visual cortex, and it was inherited from the common ancestor. No transformations. So um, we can make really valid inferences um, by doing this comparative analysis. Unfortunately, if I just look at one species, it's not going to tell me the whole story. So if I want to know about human evolution, I can't really just look at humans. I have to look at other primates. I want to look at other mammals. I want to look at non-mammalian vertebrates, um, invertebrates, to understand basic principles of organization. So our comparative studies, and I should say our methods, we use electrophysiological recording techniques where we record it from vast region, uh, regions of the brain, um, a huge chunks of the brain. We combine that with an architectonic analysis where we cut the brains and we looked at them. Um, we stuck injections or, or of neuroanatomical tracers in different portions of the brain and saw that there were similar patterns of connections. So for, I'll use my example of V1. Um, if I put an anatomical tracer into V1 and I looked at patterns of connections, it turns out that all species have, have projections from this portion of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, and V1 projects to extrastriate cortex, even in the absence of use. So if you looked at a blind mole rat whose eyes have gotten very small and skin has grown over their eyes, they still have a V1. They still have projections from the lateral geniculate nucleus. This suggests that there are huge constraints in how you can build a nervous system. You don't get rid of things. You shrink them down. And it turns out in the blind mole rat, the visual system has been co-opted by the auditory system based on alterations in subcortical connections. But they still have basic aspects of, of that system that you can't get rid of. Um, again, suggesting that there are huge constraints, and maybe Steve will talk about, about this a little bit, probably due to how genes are deployed in development, this, this, this if-then um, cascade of events. If this happens, this happens, then this happens, then this. If you pull out something really early in development, you have a non-viable species or a non-viable individual. Okay. However, there are differences. So there are common features of organization that all brains share, but there are differences. This is a flattened view of a macaque monkey cortex. This is the front. This is the top. This is a flattened view of a mouse. They are not drawn to scale. A mouse is much, much smaller. And I can say, okay, I have area red, which is the primary somatosensory area. I have the primary visual area. They both have an A1. They both have this posterior parietal cortex. I see huge differences in these brains as well. So the relative size of fields, how much of the cortex does a sensory area um, uh, <coughs> occupy is very different. What percentage, for example? The, the relative relationship of fields, so V1 is almost right next to S1 in a mouse. It's really far removed. We have the addition of cortical fields. We have the expansion of some regions of cortex. So this is a little schematic I made a, a while ago um, that sort of talks about some of these systems level changes. And you could probably make a similar schematic if you were looking at 
cellular evolution or molecular evolution. But I think the point is, is that there appear to be a handful of ways in which neocortex has been modified in different species that generate the remarkable phenotypic va variability that we see on the planet Earth. Um, one uh, um, is, is pretty obvious and we've known for a really long time. Um, these squares equal, a that this is meant to indicate a cortical sheet. So we can have differences in the size of the cortical sheet. We have differences in sensory domain allocation. And this is an important thing I'm going to, ooh, an important thing I'm going to talk about a, a little bit later. So the amount of cortex devoted to processing inputs from a particular sensory system. How much of my, my cortex is devoted to processing visual input, somatosensory input, auditory input, and so on. So we have sensory domain allocation. The relative size of cortical fields, so in some species, V1 may be relatively large. Um, on the, or, or take up a large chunk of the cortical sheet, and another species a relatively small portion, like our naked mole rat, rat example. Um, magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts, so that if something's important, it gets a lot of cortical territory. So that posterior parietal cortex that I showed you in, human, in the macaque monkey and in humans is enormous, and it's about the hands and it's about the eyes. Um, if you look at S1 in a rat, the primary somatosensory cortex in a rat, a huge amount of the cortex is devoted to processing inputs from the whiskers, and it has a little tiny v, uh, V1. So that's what I mean by magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts. I'm going to talk about this. Um, the addition of modules, which I'm not going to talk about, and I, I'm not even going to discuss it. We can talk about it later if you want to, and I can't imagine why you would. Um, <laughs> there are way better things to do in Barcelona than talk about the addition of modules to the cortical sheet. Um, the number of cortical fields, which I've already talked about, and connections of cortical fields. And, and, and so similar cortical fields or homologous cortical fields can have similar patterns of connections, but also new connections, which can change the degrees of freedom of processing information dramatically. And, and I think a lot of people now are think that one of the larger differences between us and our, close, our closest real relatives, the, the chimpanzee, is not simply the size of the, our, our neocortex, but also differences in, in or changes in um, patterns of connections. So our premise is that natural variation in these aspects of cortical organization or features within a population must ultimately lead to speciation. And I'm going to talk about three of these today. One is going to be sensory domain allocation. How do we get changes in sensory domain allocation? Magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts, um, connections of cortical fields. So what factors contrib contribute to these modifications? Obviously, genetic factors contribute to uh, some of these modifications. And there are two types of factors. I'm, I'm, I'm only going to discuss very briefly, and it's not my work, it's somebody else's work. There are genes intrinsic to the developing neocortex which contribute to aspects of cortical aerialization, um, cortical field number, cortical connectivity. Um, there are aspects, or genetic genes contribute to aspects that are extrinsic to the neocortex but intrinsic to the organism that are involved in the development of the body plan. So if, I, if my special effectors um, or specialized body parts impact my neocortex, then changes to my body, genetic changes to my body, are very important um, for uh, generating changes to the neocortex. Then, then we're gonna, I want to talk about what we call epigenetic. And epigenetic has had a lot of different meanings over time. I'm going to talk about a more modern meaning, which is activity dependent or contextual. The context in which I develop, can the context in which I develop change those concrete things that I, I showed in the previous slide within an individual brain? So what our, our lab's question is, can we induce some of these modifications some of these modifications um, in a developing nervous system and generate a phenotype that is consistent with what evolution would produce and thereby test some of our theories of how these changes come about in species over time. Um, so first I'm going to give you examples from the natural world in differences in peripheral morphology. So I kind of mix comparative stuff with developmental stuff. Then I want to talk about our, some of our experimental manipulations in peripheral morphology. I want to talk about a new project in the lab, which I really like, called Lab Rats Gone Wild, and, and who I'm doing that with. And then a really cool study, um, natural variation in early sensory experience within a population. Okay, changes in peripheral morphology, observations from the natural world. And this is my favorite observation from the natural world, and it's the duckbill platypus. Um, it has an extreme morphological specialization. So this is a bill. It looks like it's been super glued onto a mammal, right? Um, it's got little tiny eyes. Here are its ears. So this animal is semi-aquatic. All of its activity occurs in the water. And when it's doing anything important, mating, um, uh, foraging, interacting, having social interactions with other platyp platypuses, um, it closes its eyes, its ears, and its nose. So all it's got is its bill. And its bill has specialized receptors, mechanosensory receptors, that are exquisitely uh, sensitive to touch, running in stripes like this and interdigitate it 
it has evolved electrosensory receptors. So it can detect really small changes in electrical activity in the water that it's prey when it, a prey moves a, a leg or something like that. So it moves around like this. Um, and so it is a big, huge bill. It's hard for you to imagine what it's like, but it's a big, huge bill. That's how it sees its entire world. So what is its neocortex like? So obviously there have to be um, changes uh, to body plan that are genetically mediated um, that, 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 that generate a bill like this. But what does its neocortex look like? So if you record from the neocortex with lots of electrophysiological, uh, lots of recording sites, and you look at what is, what is the representation of its body, what you'll find is something extraordinary. This is the front of the brain. This is a flattened view of the neocortex. This is the top of the brain. This is a little tiny, teeny visual cortex. It's just small, as small as can be. This is the representation of the body in the primary somatosensory cortex. Here's the body. Here's the hind limb, forelimb. So it's a platypunculus. Look at the representation of the bill. It's enormous. The bill takes up 90% of the primary somatosensory field. There are other body representations within the platypus uh, neocortex. And you have a collar representation, a rostral representation. Here's the representation of the bill, and here's the representation of the bill. So of the, on the entire cortical sheet, the bill takes up about 70% of the neocortex. So this animal's living by a bill. So the question, of course, is, is it because there were changes to the body and behavior, and then this happened? Are there changes intrinsic to the neocortex that generate these sorts of things? We look at extreme examples, and I'm going to actually I'll go to my next slide. We look at extreme examples um, because they help us understand more subtle differences uh, of, in how brains change. So my question, of course, is to what extent are these differences in cortex associated with differences in, one, genes intrinsic to the neocortex through evolution, traditional evolutionary mechanisms, genes associated with the development of the body, evolution, epigenetic influences on the body or context, um, hardness of the diet, gravitational stress on bone density, other sorts of things, sensory driven activity during a development, which would be context, um, and use of the morphology, which is behavior. So this is my, my only talk. I'm, this is the only little molecular thing I'm going to show here. Um, that this is work from Dennis O'Leary's laboratory. Genes in intrinsic to the neocortex can alter cortical field size. Um, one of those aspects of organization that have changed in species over time. So this is. I don't know why he puts the front of the brain up, and this is the this is the top of the brain here. Here's the primary somatosensory cortex. You can see this is a uh, uh, 5-HT serotonin. This is V1, and this is A1 in a normal mouse. Um, if he um, deletes EMX2, which is a, a gene that's involved in aerialization of the neocortex uh, or establishing cortical field identity early in development and then deploying other genes which um, uh, establish cortical field identity, what he finds is that he can, if he overexpresses EMX2, he can increase the size of V1. He shifts all these cortical fields rostral. So we know that genes intrinsic to the neocortex during development can generate some of these types of changes, like an enlarged cortical field, like an enlarged S1, for example. Um, this is from Elizabeth Grove's lab. Uh, position of FGF8 determines patterning of cortical fields. So she has electroporated, um, is it FGF2, Steve? Are you there? Are you listening? FGF2 or is it FGF8? Okay, FGF8. She's electroporated FGF8 into different portions of the developing brain, and she's able to get duplicated representations of V1, the barrels, the body part, which is really exciting. So we know that genes, oh, yes, sorry, here it is. Genes intrinsic to the neocortex can do a lot of interesting things or, or, or produce a lot of changes that we see in species over time. And this is a really cool study um, by, uh, from Credos's lab where he looked at uh, a comparative study of genes that are involved in forelimb uh, development. He looked at bats that have this extraordinary uh, derived forelimb, and he, compa and he compared it to mouse, which has a basic forelimb with five digits. So in a, in a, in a bat, um, the thumb is free. These are the digits. They've been elongated. The, the bones have gotten very light. These are the fingers. They have interdigit membranes. They have a pro wing. They have a, a wing between their forelimb, uh, their forearm and their uh, uh, proximal forelimb. So the body morphology is really different, okay? So he looked at uh, there, and it turns out the story's worked out really well. How do you make a bat wing? There are a few players, a few players in, 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 that are involved in extending the forearm, in reducing interdigit membranes, in elongating the digits. One of them is PRX1. And he looked at bat forelimb development, and he looked at, and compared it with mouse forelimb development, and he found that in middle stages of development, you have a slight change in the expression of this gene and a few other genes. And it can transform this into this. So little tiny genetic tweaks 
in changes in the body can generate enormous phenotypic variability of the forelimb. But here's the interesting, cool thing. So if you look at a bat, and everybody knows that certainly echolocate, you know, uh, microcoraptor bats are echolocators, so they have an enormous auditory cortex, and here you go. But people have actually mapped out the forelimb of bats in somatosensory cortex, and if you look at the forelimb of a mouse compared to the forelimb of a bat, and I should tell you something that's really important, I didn't. Bats have these, you see these little lines? They're actually composed of these little things called touch domes that are exquisitely sensitive to slight changes in air pressure. So this is um, self-powered uh, or self-propelled flight. I, it's really important to, to be able to detect small changes in air current when you're in the air. And so they have these specialized wings. So remember I said, you, you usually don't have a specialized body part without specialized use. So if you look at the organization of the somatosensory cortex, you can see this really large representation of the wing. So is that due to genes intrinsic to the neocortex? Is that due to changes in peripheral morphology that are genetically driven? Is it due to use or is it due to some sort of combination of those things? And it's probably due to some sort of combination of those things. So changes in morphology are generally associated with preferential use of specialized body part or sensory receptor array. So why is this important? Because you're saying, okay, well, you showed me about a bill of a platypus. That's really interesting if I were like on the Discovery Channel. But what does that have to do with me, a human being? Well, here's what it has to do with you. We can extract general principles of organization by looking at highly derived species. So if I say, okay, well, we've got Broca's area in humans, and that's a special area that's been plopped in humans, I don't think it is a special area that's been plopped in humans. If we look at the history of change, we see that if you have a specialized receptor, uh, or a specialized receptor array and a specialized body part, and you use it in a very special way, you get an enlargement of that body part. Humans, uh, the supralaryngeal tract is highly specialized. Our oral structures are highly specialized. We have movement of sensory receptors to the tip of our tongue. So Broca's area, if it's following the rules of construction that all brains follow, is simply a magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part, which is this, um, in our somatosensory motor and premotor cortex. So understanding these sorts of species, and this is beautiful work by Ken Catania, who I recommend highly if you haven't ever read any of his stuff, who's done work in the naked mole rat. I didn't, I didn't explain this, for, sorry. If you ever saw a star-nosed mole with a very specialized, they see their world like this with just these little follicles. They have a huge representation of the, of the star-nosed mole, the, the nose in S1. Naked mole rats, I talked about them. They have specialized teeth. Their jaws are actually, the lower jaw is actually independent and they um, explore um, and make tactile discriminations with their teeth. A huge representation of the teeth. And then I gave the example of humans. So studying highly derived species and specializations can, can help us understand human special, specializations and, and how they may have come about. Okay, so the next part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about experimental manipulations of peripheral morphology. Okay, so here's the animal model that we use. We use what's called a uh, little um, South American opossum. It's the short-tailed opossum or Monodelphus domestica. Um, the thing, we're, we're gonna manipulate its visual system and trying to get at this body-brain relationship and, and how, how, what sort of impact does the body have on brain organization. Uh, a lot of people work on mice and rats. A number of people work on ferrets because if you look at things like retinal ganglion cell axons, when does the eye, um, neurons from the eye grow into its next target? When do thalamocortical projections, so that target, the lateral geniculi nucleus, when does it grow into the cortex? A lot of this happens, po this happens before birth. So if I wanna look at these sorts of things, I would have to do in utero manipulations. Um, you can use something like a ferret, um, where some of this occurs after birth. But if you look at Monodelphus domestica, all of these things occur postnatally. So if I want to manipulate a developing nervous system, physically manipulate a developing nervous system, I can do it ex utero. Um, and so this is what it looks like. This is a little Monodelphus domestica. Um, this is P4, you can see. It doesn't even have a hind limb. It just has a little tail-like thing. It's got a little forelimb bud. It doesn't have a proper mouth. It crawls out, finds a nipple, swallows the nipple. The nipple adheres to the stomach. Um, but what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, so, and this is a fairly gross manipulation. What is the role of visual input in establishing organization of visual cortex in this animal, establishing connections and neural response properties? Um, and I'm only gonna talk about some of those. So what I can do is I can bilaterally enucleate this animal before the, the eye reaches its next target, before that next target, the lateral nucleus, reaches the cortex. So before the connections are formed, I got kind of a blank slate. I'm gonna just take away the two eyes and what happens? And so I, the first level is like, okay, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut the neocortex and I'm gonna look at it um, because I can identify cortical fields by looking at it. These are flattened views of the neocortex. This is the front of the brain, this is the top of the brain. Here's the primary visual area in a normal animal, second visual area. They have a nice, relatively nice visual cortex. 
if I look at my nucleus, this doesn't show it well, but believe it or not, the overall size of the neocortex hasn't changed. I can still identify, just like a blind mole rat, a little tiny V1 architectonically. Obviously, it's not a visual area because there's no visual input, but it's much smaller. So V1 has, it has gotten significantly smaller as I measure it using this architectonic technique. And S1 has increased in size. So I've changed proportions. I've changed the relative size of cortical fields by doing nothing to the neocortex itself, simply by removing um, all visual input. If I look at the functional organizations and connections of these bilateral nucleus in adults, what happens? So each one of these little dots represents an electric penetration. The red dots represent neurons that responded to somatosensory stimulation or tactile stimulation. The blue dots represent neurons that respond to visual stimulation. And the, red, the uh, green dots represent neurons that responded to auditory stimulation. So this would be my sensory domain allocation, OK? So if I look at a normal animal, Neurons in visual cortex respond to visual stimulation, somatosensory cortex, mainly somatosensory stimulation, and auditory cortex, mainly auditory stimulation. So it works out really well. If I look at the bilateral nucleate, where visual cortex is supposed to be, and I can, I can see it architectonically, um, neurons aren't just sitting around doing nothing. It's not a dead space in the brain. All of what would normally be visual cortex is completely taken over by the auditory and the somatosensory system. So I've completely changed sensory domain allocation by doing nothing to the neocortex itself, simply by changing the ratio of sensory inputs that are coming into that developing brain. Notice that in some of these animals, S1 has been functionally, re is functionally reorganized as well, where neurons are now responding to auditory and somatosensory stimulation as opposed to just somatosensory stimulation alone. And so we saw variability um, in these types of maps that were generated. Yeah? yeah. Question? No? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, when, you, when you have that in nuclear, you, you talk about it taking over by the somatosensory system. Is it, do you, do you know anything about whether or not, do you know whether or not it's, a, it's a, situ, a situation where you are retaining already existing connections or whether it actually is an outgrowth? Process? No, we don't. We, that's a really good point. So, so I don't know that if you have the lamocortical afferents that are coming to the neocortex from the ventral posterior for nucleus, for instance, are they normally in V1 and then they get pruned? We, we haven't done that developmental study, but it's a really good question. Um, right. Um, so if you look at receptive fields, do you guys know what a receptive field is? OK, it's the portion of the, for the somatosensory system. It's the portion of the body that that neuron wants to listen to. So in rats, if I look at receptive fields in the barrel system, neurons would want to respond to, they're responding to deflections of the whiskers. And you have a huge number of neurons that are responding to that. So if I look at what neurons are responding to in this reorganized uh, visual cortex, almost all of them, or a huge percentage, are responding to the, uh, have receptive fields on the snout, face, vibrissian head. Very few on the lower limbs. So this animal normally has a representation of, the, of these in S1. And now in that reorganized V1, it has an enlarged representation. So I've, I have this huge behavioral magnification of the head in this area around, and, and the, the, the vibrissi, the chin vibrissi, the neris. So I've changed one of those features of organization, which is behaviorally relevant, ma uh, magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts by doing nothing to the neocortex itself, simply by removing visual input. And I should say that um, a, a, a graduate student in my laboratory is, is currently um, doing single unit recordings in visual cortex and in um, somatosensory cortex of normal animals and bilateral nucleates to see um, how those neurons respond. And also, and this is the hard part, looking at behavior. So this animal has this huge representation of the face, head, vibrissi. Does it do something better than a normal animal in terms of tactile discrimination? And so if I look at connections in these bilateral nucleates, these are after they've become adults. This is a, you can't really see it. There's a little teeny dot there. That's an injection of an anatomical tracer in the primary visual cortex. In a normal animal, it has connections with V2, which is another visual area, CT, another visual area, and a little bit with entorhinal cortex. If I have an injection in architectonically defined area 17 in a, our bilateral nucleate, it's getting input from the somatosensory cortex, the auditory cortex, frontal cortex. These are uh, digital images of labeled cells in the dorsal thalamus, and it's also getting input from the ventral posterior nucleus. I don't know. Um, we haven't done developmental studies to see um, if, if it, it, to answer uh, Mark's question, but they're on the slate. So this is just an overview of, of, what, of what things look like. So normal cortex thalamus to um, inputs to primary visual cortex, 
altered inputs to primary visual cortex. So I can change the structural wiring of the brain by altering the ratio of sensory inputs coming into the developing brain. And as I noted that in some animals, S1 was reorganized as well. So we looked at connections. This is a graduate student in my lab, James Dooley. One of his projects was looking at connections of S1 in normal and bilaterally nucleated animals. So we put a little anatomical injection in S1. And what he found was really remarkable, that here are normal projections of S1. These are labeled cells um, that resulting from that anatomical tracer injection. In S2, projecting to S1, another somatosensory area called SC, a rostral somatosensory area. Basically, most of the projections are from other somatosensory areas. If I look at um, connections of S1 in a bilateral nucleate, I have connections from visual areas, lots of connections from piriform cortex, multimodal cortex. So loss of visual input not only affects the connectivity of the visual system, it affects the connectivity of the entire, well, I think the entire cortical sheet. So the point is, if you say, okay, um, and this is just a, a diagram showing in normal animals, the percentage of connections um, or projections to S1, 82% are from other somatosensory areas, um, and very few from auditory, visual, multimodal cortex, and this is remarkably different in the bilateral nucleate. And also, he's done thalamocortical projections, and he sees changes in thalamocortical connections, but not as dramatic. They're a lot more subtle. So, so I, 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 I like to give this example. You say, okay, I know, I, I know what it's like to be blind. I'm just going to close my eyes and I'm blind. In fact, that's not what it's like to be blind because it, if you're blind, your entire nervous system has been rewired. Um, no changes due to gene sequence in the neocortex, um, but clear alterations in how the brain is connected up, the functional organizations. And we know from studies from Helen Neville's lab, for example, that um, in terms of auditory and tactile discriminations, blind people are better. Okay, so we can invoke phenotypic alterations in cortical field size, sensory domain allocation, magnification of e uh, ecologically relevant body parts, and connectivity without making any direct modifications to the cortex itself. This suggests that species differences arise not only um, from changes in genes intrinsic to the neocortex, traditional evolutionary mechanisms, um, but from alterations in peripheral morphology and use, as well as sensory input, or, or context dependent. Um, and we also demonstrate that removing sensory input affects not just the targeted system, but the, but the entire network, cortical network. Okay, so now I want to talk about new experiments in the laboratory. And I don't, I don't have much more to go. Anna, is my time okay? Am I? Yeah, you're doing well. Okay. No, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mom. <laughs> so these are, new <laughs> these are new experiments in the laboratory. Um, I don't know about the rest. <laughs> that we call Laboratory Rats Gone Wild. And I think you're going to really like this. So, so what we've done is, you know, removing two eyes is, you know, that, that doesn't happen. I mean, there aren't a lot of congenitally blind people. But we wanted to do, make an, do an extreme example so we can see the types of changes that might arise from loss of sensory input. But how about something more subtle? So this, these studies came about through work of a graduate student of mine, um, Catherine Campy. So what she did was, and you know, I'm actually quite persuasive and I could talk graduate students into doing this. I said, hey, you know, we're, we're looking at the visual, we're doing comparative analysis of visual cortex in squirrels, highly visual, two-cone color vision, and we're gonna compare it with rats. And I was like, well, it's not really fair to compare it with laboratory rats because they're just being reared in a little box like this. Why don't you go out and catch some rats? And she's like, okay, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> so she caught squirrels um, and she caught laboratory rats. And I wanna say this, and you probably don't know this because probably very few of you have actually caught a rat or a squirrel. A, la a, a squirrel, I mean a rat, when caught, a wild rat, is really, really mean. Only to be exceeded by a wild caught squirrel, which if it could, it would kill you. And so she, <laughs> they're really mean. So she did this. And, and what she found, just looked at uh, changes in cortical field size. She looked at differences in cellular density in V1, and she saw really remarkable changes um, uh, in a laboratory rat compared to a wild rat. And they're the same species, Rattus norvegus. But that was a little uncontrolled. So this is done in conjunction with Dylan Cook, um, Daniel Stolzenberg, these are both colleagues of mine at uh, UC Davis, and Shauna Simon um, also worked on this project. She's in the audience right now. She can, she can tell you a little bit about it, probably, um, if you want to hear more. But it's a hard project. So our, our animal models are reared like this. And is this species typical behavior? So, at UC Davis, we have a really amazing resource. We have field pens out in, in it's called the Puda Creek Riparian Reserve. This is an aerial view. Um, this is our, these are our field pens. This is what they look like up close. 
This is Dylan. This is a human with a rake. But they're exposed to little natural prey, which they eat. Um, they're exposed to auditory um, signals from what would normally be um, predators. They have little lizards in their cage. They have an enormous amount of space to run around in. I think it's 3,000 times larger than their cage. So their behaviors are going to be quite different. So they have a range of environmental conditions. Temperatures range from 43 degrees to 12 degrees Celsius. Humidity from 4 to 100%. Had an earthquake. As I said, they have predator cues um, from, wild, uh, from wild turkeys and raptors. Um, and we have a nest box inside where they, where they really like to be. When, and we, so we take pregnant mothers and we put them out in these, in these cages. And we, video, we have video surveillance, and we have video surve surveillance um, across development. Um, and we have a similar situation um, set up in the laboratory where we're videoing lab rats, same cage, same nest box size. And we're, we're doing a lot of different things. So we're looking at body weight, we're looking at temperature, behavioral tests. Um, we're looking at mo motor maps. I mean, my interest is in looking at organization and connectivity of cortex. Um, and we're looking at epigenetic markers, or things that can alter gene transcription in regions of, of interest in the neocortex. And what was what's really remarkable is that even basic developmental, well, de the developmental trajectories are, are, are very different. Even basic developmental milestones, like eye-opening, eye are different from our, our field pen animals compared to laboratory animals. If we look at gait, we have differences in gait. If we look at tests like the Barnes maze, um, these animals perform significantly different. And in fact, um, the wild, wild reared rats, or the semi natural rats um, will actually find the escape hole and go in really rapidly. Laboratory rats don't even go into the hole. So they're, they're, not, they're actually not exhibiting uh, species typical behavior at all. But what's really cool, so if you look at this, here's this animal here, you know, what, what is this doing in terms of development of the somatosensory and the motor system? And these are, these are field pen rats and you can see they're crawling all over the cage, they're on their nest box. This is how they're drinking their water. It's a really different situation than this. So the first thing we did, this is with Dylan Cook, we looked at um, the organization of their motor cortex. So each one of these points is an electrode that's been stuck in the brain, and we pass a really tiny current through it, and we look at what the evoked movement is. And what, what we find is that in our laboratory rats, we have a relatively large representation of the mouth and the vibrissae, and hardly any trunk or hind limb. In these field pen rats, we have a really large representation of the hind limb, and it's not shown in this particular case. We also have a very large representation of the tail, which you never see in a laboratory rat. So we've, we've ev evoked changes um, in um, maps of behavior behaviorally relevant body parts um, by rearing these animals in these different conditions. And of course, this is this, I mean, I just put a grant in for this. So this stuff is really, really. Um, what age is this? This animal was, this animal was mapped at, I think it was about, I want to say P30, P33. Um, so this is like hot off the press. Obviously, what we want to do is look at changes in connect see if there are changes in connectivity of S1 and M1. We're going to look at the visual system and, and a number of other things. So there's, there's a big area. Uh, there's a big area there uh, on the field pen rate, which is not marked. Is anything? What's it doing? Here. Uh, in S1. Right in here. We, we couldn't evoke. We didn't evoke movements. And so the thing with this is this is only one map. We have about four or five. You need to look across a variety of different cases because there's going to be natural va variability in motor maps just normally, even if you just looked at, even if you just looked at laboratory. But there are some things that you never see, like a huge representation of the hind limb and/or a tail representation. I'm just uh, really surprised that the vibrissae seems to be occupying less of an area, but maybe that's not too early. You, you, to it's too early to tell. You need to look at an, a, a variety of different represent yeah, a, a variety of different maps and then quantify those differences. So it's not easy, but, it's, but you, you can do it. But what's really cool, and this is, this is and I mean, you know what would be cool for these experiments, Tone, um, is we get Evard Mozar to collaborate with me <laughs> 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 and look at grid neurons. <laughs> because one wonders what you would get. I, I, I'm gonna get a man right on that. You, can you talk to him tonight? If you get him, get him drunk and tell him it's a good idea. So what's really cool is, if, I don't know if you, if people in the audience are following the literature, there's a, it's, it's a big hot topic now is epigenetics. So looking at how genes are transcribed or how they're expressed in development and what, 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 what are the things that are, are changing transcription and what are the mechanisms. And some of these are, are histone acetylation and DNA methylation. And you have, can have markers for this, like HDAC4 expression. So we take punches of the affected cortex. This is posterior parietal, A1. In this case, S1. 
and we look at the, we quantify the expression of these, of these epigenetic marks, and it turns out that in field pen mice, in the areas affected, we have differences in, in expression of, of HDAC, which is presumably changing transcription, which is presumably generating some of the changes that we're seeing in the neocortex um, based on the context in which this animal is reared. Okay, so alterations in the environment um, in which an animal develops has a large impact on motor cortex organization as well as sensory processing. This alters developmental tra tra trajectories and subsequent behavior, um, and we think the underlying mechanisms include epigenetic marks, which alter gene transcription during critical periods. And I should say, we're doing a number, we also propose that the, this highly dynamic environment in which this animal is reared makes the, may make the brain more plastic or more cha be able to uh, alter more dramatically than a laboratory animal. So, and w one way to test that is through behavior. If presented with novel sensory motor tasks, do they do better? Um, and can they learn faster? So those are, th those are where those studies are going. But like I said, they're kind of in their infancy. And so I'm going to finish by. So uh, just to interrupt, because. Because Paul's thinking, not here? <laughs> uh, do you think you need another control, which is some intermediate state where the, the animals live a more natural life, but in a, a lab? We thought about that, about, you know, like the classic enrichment. And yeah. it's, pr it's, 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 a possible, it's a possible thing to do. They're already kind of complicated um, experiments. One thing we are going to do is, is those were done with, um, we're going we're gonna to use Norwegian brown rats. They're, they're highly inbred, so that the genetic variability is going to be really low. Um, but it might be a good idea to do an interme intermediate. But these are pretty uh, tough experiments. You can talk to Shauna. She was also involved in going out there and checking those animals. In the summer and 104 degrees, you have to check them every day. So there, there's that, that, that husbandry, husbandry side yeah. is tough. But it's not a bad idea. Yeah. Okay, so so now I want to talk. The final set of experiments is a is a an even more subtle um, sort of thing that, that gets at this how you modify aspects of cortical organization and in what part is context dependent and what part is genetic. And these are experiments that have been done by Adele Selke. Adele was a graduate student with Mark, um, and she she is no longer in my laboratory, but working with Karen Bales uh, and still continuing this whole project. So I want to talk about natural differences in rearing condition, tactile contact, can generate changes in cortical organization and connectivity and behavior. And so there are natural diff differences in social rearing in voles. So they actually, voles fall under, prairie voles fall under a, a normal distribution of th this one type of parenting behavior. So first of all, they're, monog they're monogamous, and both the father and the mother rear the young. And you can actually measure the amount of tactile contact that vole parents have with their babies. When the mother's nursing, when they're huddling, when they're grooming, when they're carrying them from one spot to another, you just you track it and you, you count it. And you can say lots of contact, very little contact. Obviously, they don't, it's not a dichotomy. It's a normal distribution. So we take the high contacts and we take the low contacts and we look at them. Um, and this is just an example of, of some of these behaviors, non-huddling, neutral nursing, lateral nursing. This is maternal significantly different, and this is maternal and, and paternal. Um, what's really interesting is that if you cross foster, and this work um, is currently being prepared for publication by Alison Perkabilly, who is a graduate student in Karen Bales' lab, and I should say this was done in conjunction with Karen Bales. If you cross, but, so first of all, if you're a high contact mother, um, if you're a high contact offspring, you become a high contact parent. If you're a low contact offspring, you become a low contact. And I'm not putting a positive or a negative sign on this, saying, oh, if you're a high contact, you're a good mother, and if you're a low contact, you're a bad mo mother. Because one can imagine scenarios where low contact is good. If food is scarce and you've got to be out foraging all the time, you're not hanging out and like licking your babies. Um, you're out catching food. So anyway, <laughs> I'm so, I sound so scientific sometimes. <laughs> It's startling, isn't it, that they still call me doctor? <laughs> but here's what's cool. If you cross foster and you take a low contact baby on the day of birth and you put it with a high contact parent, it becomes what its fostered parent is. It doesn't become what its biological parent is, suggesting that this is cultural, right? It's passed on. Um, how you're reared is what you become. Karen's lab is also looking at, at a lot of social behavior subsequently as juveniles, and they're different between high and low contact. One's not better or worse, but just, you know, um, how long, you know, how long does it take to, for them to approach um, a strange vole versus a, a familiar vole and all these sorts of things. And so their, their social behaviors are different as well. So of course our question is, what's going on in the neocortex? 
So these are studies that are still in progress, and these are each one of these dots is an electrode penetration. And I get, I'm hoping by now you're not surprised. If we look at this peri, this is the perioral mouth region, and a lot of the contact is going on right here, at the right in this sort of fovea of the face of the baby. And if we look at the representation of this perioral region in these voles, we see that in high contact you have a large perioral face region, and in low contact a, a smaller. That shouldn't be surprising. So we can generate changes in um, representation of presumably a behaviorally relevant body part um, by these differences in contact with the parents that are also tied to early social um, rearing. If we look at injection, so if we want to inject, if we want to look at connections of S1, and we're trying to hit this region right here, the perioral mouth region, and it, this is a really hard set of experiments, and Adele did a beautiful job. It just came out in, I think it was Journal of Neuro, uh, Comparative Neurology, just came out uh, like a month ago. So she matched injections in these high and low contact animals. High is red, blue is um, low contact, um, and compared those groups, and she, she matched them for age, sex, um, and obviously injection size and injection location. These are injections of anatomical tracers. She looked at the neurons, she counted neurons in the different regions, and what she found was that there were differences in connectivity. Most of the connections were similar. So you have high contact, this is an injection in S1, it's getting input from M1, somatosensory cortex, multimodal cortex, uh, low contact, injection in S1, getting input from M1, S, S2, PV. It's also getting input from FM. It's getting more input from PR. And if you look at the percentages of cells that are labeled, oh, and this is um, colossal, which is um, remarkably different, where you're having inputs from the contralateral um, S1 and M1 in high contact, much, many more um, neurons um, projecting from S1 and M1 in the low contact and from S2 and PR. So I'm getting, and she measured these, she counted, she did, she, um, did this in several cases or a number of cases, and what she found was that in, you know, these are differences um, in uh, high contact has more intrinsic connections within S1 than low contact. Low contact has more connections with uh, projections from M1, S2, PV, FM. If you look at contralateral label, you can see that, as I showed you, more connections from um, M1, S2, PV, M1, PR. So you can, you can quantify these differences just based on subtle differences in connectivity of the brain based on differences in parental rearing styles that generate differences in the amount of contact an individual is having early in development. And we did the, this mi micro dissection thing again with Danielle. So we took a punch um, and we looked at, also we looked at olfactory co cortex, and I have to say this is early days for this ex these experiments as well. Um, and we don't have a ton of cases, but we're seeing a trend, and I think if we increase our N, we'll get a, a difference um, in S1 of uh, uh, molecules involved in synaptic plasticity. In olfactory cortex, we're getting differences in HDAC4, or an epigenetic mark, um, in high contact versus low contact animals. In olfactory cortex, we're also getting differences in FRNA5, um, suggesting that there are uh, changes in uh, gene expression, which may generate these changes in some of the cortical connections that we see. But so there's still a lot to explore. Uh, Layla, were you, you serious? Sorry, Layla. Were you were serious about um, the mums licking. That's what they do, is it? Or is that social contact? The social contact is licking, it's nursing, it's lateral nursing, it's huddling. Sometimes they just huddle over the animals. Right. So it's, it's a, a variety. And, and obviously the fathers aren't nursing, but... But they're huddling with other pups when uh, in the non-contact group, are they? Oh, they oh, they're still huddling. They're just huddling less often. So it's the amount, it's the total amount of time that they're spent doing. It's not that the low contact has no contact. It means they just have less time doing these similar behaviors. So it could be an effect of uh, tactile stimulation during huddling. Is yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, and there are a lot of systems you want to look at, not just, we're looking at somatosensory because it seemed the most obvious, but I mean, olfactory would probably be really important as well because they're very close. You want to look at limbic. I think looking at the limbic system would be really important. I would, I would think that just like the, our bilateral nucleates, where we took a sledgehammer to the system to see what sorts of changes, you're not just going to get a change in the one cortical field, that you're going to get this distributed network change across the entire brain um, that, that, that generates these differences in subsequent behavior. OK, so I'm going to finish here saying that we can't consider cortical evolution or phenotypic changes across species without appreciating within life changes to the cortical phenotype. Um, developmental studies allow us to appreciate how phenotypic transformations occur and underscore the importance of context. And I hope you walk away thinking, wow, context is really important. That if I took Leah Krubitzer and I put her in human society 200,000 years ago when I was anatomically the same, my brain would be fundamentally different. It would be wired in a different way. 
Um, species obviously evolve, but some features of organization can masquerade as traditional evolutionary changes. Um, and these features, like connections and map organization, are actually context dependent and persist for thousands, and probably can persist for thousands of years if the sensory and physical context in which an individual develops is static. So what factors contribute to the cortical phenotype? Well, genes, of course, and I we've just talked about this a little bit. They can contribute to cortical sheet size, cortical field size, cortical connections and peripheral morphology, um, and cellular mechanisms involved in plasticity. But the environment can change some of these same things. So internal organization, um, sensory domain allocation, cortical field size, cortical connections, and peripheral morphology. I gave examples of the bill of the platypus, and I try to relate that to changes that we see in the human brain that we think are purely human, but, but they're following the same rules of construction that other brains follow. So what about things like social learning, language, and culture? I think if we just say these are all complex patterns of physical stimuli that vary during development and throughout evolution and are have, have a huge impact on how our brain is organized and, and interconnected. So that's my talk. This is my laboratory. Um, Deepa is doing some of the single unit stuff in Monodelphus. Here's Dylan. Jimmy um, did a lot of the Monodelphus work. Adele Silke did the vol work. Michaela um, Donaldson is my lab manager, and she's really amazing. Um, and other people in the lab are working on other projects. OK, so that's it. <laughs> any questions? Any questions for Leia? You were saying just now that uh, you can change the functions of uh, this. No, sorry, like uh, the receptive field of like a V1 will decrease if uh, you are blind. And <coughs> is it possible to regain function or increase the size of the V1 back again through training? Or? Um, so people are doing that. What's going to be nice is Greg Rickenzone is going to talk about the effects of skilled, skilled training on cortical on, uh, neural response properties um, and I think behavior. So. In terms of, so V1, if you're congenitally blind, now they have, you know, artificial retinas or artificial or retinal prosthetics, and, and they seem to work pretty well, just like uh, uh, cochlear prosthetics. But obviously, the brain is an amazing thing because it's not like all of a sudden you're blind for 50 years, you get a retinal prosthetic. Um, what's happening in V1 is not completely clear, but the, the system's already been rewired. Yet, even through that rewired system, these people learn to use these retinal prosthetics and, and, and generate you know, visually mediated behavior fairly well, not perfectly well. And if you take somebody like Michael May, he was a guy in Davis who was blinded at the age of uh, 10 or 11, and then some of his sight um, was reintroduced at the age of 54 or 55. It's a really interesting article in Science about this, and there's a woman who did a lot of behavioral stuff. And he can, he, he's able to see certain things, but he, he can't see the way you and I see. And in some ways, it was detrimental because a lot of things he used to be able to do really well, um, he, he, he can't do. And there's, a, there's also a fear. So the prosthetic, the world of prosthetics in, is really exciting and amazing. But you have to remember when you're introducing those prosthetics, if the system has been deprived for a long period of time, you're not working with the normal system. But you can still make it work. Your brain makes sense of those patterns of physical stimuli that are now impinging on it, which is amazing. Vicky? Uh, hi. Thank you. Very nice talk. I, I was wondering, one of the studies that you, that you mentioned uh, regarding, let's say, um, how the parent mouse touches the, the, the kid and how it changes the brain area. I was wondering the following. It reminded me of uh, one of the studies where uh, different cage mage, but mice from different strains or from the same strain, if they are put together in a cage, in the same cage, then when one of the cage mates, if it's found in a, in a distress, uh, how, let's say, the empathic responses of the mice is af are affected from the familiarity that they have, even if they're not from the same strain, mm -hmm. uh, but they grew up together. And I was wondering, do you think, uh, for example, whether you have like a, a low uh, percentage of touching or a high would affect also some sort of behaviors that are, uh, dare I say, empathic responses uh, to mice? I, yeah, I do. Um, I, I think it'd be, it'd be really important. And it, I mean, one of the things I like about the, the, the Vol study is, you know, the, the touch is administered through this so, sort of social system of parents. And 
if you're trying to justify, is this important to humans? I say, yeah, it's really important. These early social experiences can have a huge impact on subsequent behavior and, and, and can in fact change your brain organization. And then, I mean, if you look at, for example, abuse when young, um, that there's a greater tendency, or, or the early studies say, that you become abusive yourself. Not that you will, um, but there's certainly a higher percentage. Um, there's absolutely a higher percentage of mental disorders, of schizophrenia, of suicide attempts as teens, based on this really early social experience. Now, it's complex. It has to do more with more than just touching. But, but all of these sorts of parental behaviors are administered. Oh. I still, I'm still loud enough. All of, the, all of, these, all of these behaviors that, you're, that we call par parental love are coming in through our sensory systems. That, you know, we give them these names that are cuddly, but they're, they're still sensory experiences that have a huge impact. So yeah, I think it would affect those systems. Hi, sorry. So regarding the same study, uh, okay. um, can you hear me? Hi, so regarding the same study, uh, did you look at the size of the voles in uh, the uh, cross-fostering cases and like connectivity and stuff? We didn't, but we just got a grant for this. We literally, a month ago, and that's the idea, is that we, we're gonna cross-foster, we're gonna look at gene exp early gene expression, we're gonna do some of the uh, uh, epigenetic marks, and I mean, the controls are great. You take half of a litter and you cross-foster it, and so you have one litter that's in foster so that you can compare this litter that's that's reared with their biological parents with, with the litter, with the other half of the litter that's reared with their foster parents. And you can control, you can look at things like gene expression, cortical connectivity, um, these epigenetic marks, and, and have a really, really nice, get a real handle on the mechanisms to, to establish something causal. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're going to do. So, Leia, uh, I gave you lots of things to talk about, and you, you just about covered them all. What? Uh, the things that I asked you to talk about I said you would talk about, you covered them all. I um, did? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so one of the things that I said you were going to talk about is cortical development, and I put up a slide of uh, infants, uh, and then uh, showing how much their brains had wired, uh, and uh, your data kind of speaks to that. But uh, I'm wondering, you know, so humans have this extended periods of infancy, and also an extended childhood. So wh what looks to be happening there is that the period for brain plasticity and rewiring is extended into uh, our life uh, post postnatally? Um, well, well into our life postnatally. Exactly. Yeah. So, how much? How how is that going to impact on the ability of our brains to wire up due to culture? I mean, is it going to be uh, like this, but you know, on steroids? There's going to be massive amounts of rewiring due to culture. Um, I think that would be that would be my that would be my thought. I mean. I, I wished I could have been, I wish someone who I, I, I asked to talk about cultural evolution in humans um, and, and the impact that might have on our brains. I think, it, I think it's huge. Um, it, what would be nice <laughs> would be to get a wild caught human. Or <laughs> 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 I don't think they exist anymore. But yeah. of course, I mean, look at the changes in our culture recently, especially changes, the social changes in our culture and how we communicate with each other socially. This is going to have a huge impact on how our brains. Um, are, are wired up. Um, so, I, yeah, I, absolutely. Is there, is there a way of getting at this sort of cross-culturally with sort of track tracing? Of humans? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants a volunteer here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, people have been doing some of these cross-cultural things. I mean, I think you have to look at behavior. The problem is, if you're going to do the cross-cultural things, you're going to be stuck with fMRI, DTI, which yeah. I think kind of sucks. Um, because it's, it's, you know, or, or this, this resting state fMRI. I mean, that's the kind of crap, that's the kind of stuff people are doing. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of resting state fMRI. I'm sorry if you guys, somebody here is. You can beat me up later. Um, we will have some progress about that. You will? <laughs> oh, I know. I saw the connectome. But, I, but it's not, it, I mean, these neuroanatomical techniques are, are the best you can use to get at these questions and to pick up these subtle differences and to quantify them. The other, everything else are just indirect measures and they're correlative. So, you know, unless something's really hugely different, because if humans behave differently, is it because there's something really hugely different about your brain than my brain? Or are there a lot of little subtle differences? And, and if there are a lot of little suffer subtle differences, if that's what makes me different from you, um, they're going to be hard to pick up with modern imaging techniques. <laughs>
Uh, any last questions? Let's go eat, come on. Okay, let's go for lunch. So no, not lunch. No, not lunch, oh, not lunch, okay. not lunch. We have a little pasta station that oh, we oh, reduce. Right, right, right. So okay. please take the tent and pick, uh, put up your pasta before going to lunch. So don't disappear yet. Well, no, lunch won't be served. Lunch